All right, so with that, I wanna pass it to uh, Simon and Denny. So take it away, both of you. Perfect. Uh, Simon, you want to give it a start or you want me to give it a start? <laughs> By all means. I did it last time. You could start. Why not? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to plug the data brew. Ha 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 ha. But uh, okay. In other words, we also talk about we also talk about coffee eventually in this in the session. But the reason why I'm talking about it is because it's actually very uh, akin to exactly what we are talking about today, which is from um, data warehousing to data lakes. And in this case, it's with uh, Barry Devlin. Um, he's from the UK, from your side of the pond, Simon. Mm -hmm. And he actually, <clears throat> for many of you who may not know, uh, he was actually the one uh, who I believe described it as the illeg illegitimate, illegitimate grandfather of data warehousing because he had actually coined the term data warehousing even before Bill Inman had done it. Okay, so if well, those of you who are familiar with Kimball or Inman, there you go. So, so we had him, we had Susan O'Connell uh, and Donald Farmer. Um, for those of you that are in the Microsoft SQL Server space, uh, then you are pretty familiar with those names as well. So there you go. So, but. Nevertheless, the, the reason I started with that wasn't just to go ahead and uh, chime in about the Data Brew vidcast series. It's also to go ahead and call out the fact that that's actually where both Simon and I are coming from, right? We came from this context of SQL Server, relational database land, and now we're, you know, flow through to SQL BI, big data, Spark and now into the realm of um, Delta Lake, Data Lakes, lake houses, right? And it's been a fun, fun journey to put it lightly. So um, my, just in case you don't know who I am, my name is Denny Lee, I'm a developer advocate. Uh, I've been working within the space for a long time. Um, and yeah, we're prepared for your questions, technical questions, okay? So please chime in in any of the forums, whether it's LinkedIn, uh, Zoom, or through YouTube. Um, Simon, why don't you go ahead and do a quick introduction for yourself for those that may not know who you are. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, hello, I'm Simon. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm from the UK doing various things around data engineering and all that stuff. As Danny said, came originally from heavily Microsoft BI land. And these days I spend most of my time building lakes and Spark and teaching people how to do framework driven engineering. And a lot of the moment, especially this past two weeks, teaching SQL people how to work in a Databricks environment, which has been interesting going, you know, pure, no Python, no Scala, no nothing, SQL. Um, and yeah, just trying to figure out the best pattern, the best ways of working and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting times. And I run a consultancy called Advancing Analytics. So obviously find us on YouTube and come and talk to us and stuff. Mm. Okay. Cool. It's enough. So, uh, self promo. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's perfectly fine for self promo. We're perfectly fine doing that. And by the way, just to uh, provide some context, um, we will actually be talking a little bit about the Data and AI Summit, partially as a promotion to Data and AI Summit, but also because both Simon and myself have some pretty cool um, uh, uh, sessions. And so we're probably just going to provide a little bit of quick context as a way to encourage you to go attend our sessions because guess what? We've got some cool, geeky stuff. So nevertheless, uh, I did notice on LinkedIn that some folks were saying there's a bunch of echoes. I'm sorry, we're sorry about that. We're not entirely sure what's going on on that front. It looks like this might be a case of uh, the restreaming service we're using that's um, that's echoing it out, at least uh, at least from other ends in terms of uh, Zoom and um, YouTube, we're not getting those issues. So we'll see what we can do to try to help with the restream. But on a worst case scenario, if you can't hear it properly, um, lower it, the volume perhaps, and then we can watch it and on demand and uh, later on when uh, we push it out and then there should not be any of those echo issues. So apologies in advance. So um, let's dive in because we do have some questions already. Um, so Simon, did you want to take tackle the first ones or did you want me to tackle the first one? Oh, what should we go with as a first one? That's, that's yeah. the biggest question. Do we I go know. straight into partitioning? <laughs> what, what yeah, no, no. How? Or do we go into MVC, MVCC on concurrency algorithms? You, you know, I, I'm cool. Like whatever we think is the the right approach, just to get get the to to wet fo folks' appetite. <laughs> so to, to wet the whistle, <laughs> exactly. Wet the whistle. There we go. <laughs> I, I do have to apologize. There might be some explosions coming in the background because today is November the fifth, which is Fireworks Day in England, when we celebrate blowing up someone who tried to blow up pi uh, Parliament because that's what we do. So, you know, you might hear some things, just ignore it, it's fine. No one's blowing up, it's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I mean, so the first one, like, so 
Did we do that? So we've got how to partition a delta table that's high volume, and in each delta window is a high variety of data. I don't think we covered that too much in previous ones. We can dig into that a little. Sure, let's do that. I mean, and it's it's one of the biggest things that we get. Um, kind of the you're building a lake, you've got your various structures, you've got your bronze, silver, gold, raw base, and rich, whatever you want to call it, your three tiers of I'm building a lake and I'm uh, segmenting data. Um, and almost every time I speak to people, they try and go, I need to pick how to partition, and I partition the same way all the way through. And you just absolutely don't have to, right? For me, there's there's kind of source-based ETL partitioning. You know, how are you trying to partition for speed to get data in so you can get through your whole processing window fast? And in that, it tends to be pure like system load day, right? What what data have I changed today? What data am I loading today? Or what transaction data does data pertain to? Um, so you can do things like say, you know, replace that partition. You know, um, you can do merges and add in the partition constraints. So you're just merging in just to that window. And it's all about how do I optimize that one right transaction? How do I get data into the table in the fastest way possible? But then once you've landed the table in some kind of customer facing analytics style thing, your gold layer, your curated layer, whatever you want to call it, then it's all about who's going to query that? How do you make the query runtime faster? So it's always like partitioning early stage, speed. How do I just slot in the latest data and then leave it and I'm done? Versus how do I make 80% of the queries faster? And that's so much harder, right? Because if I'm doing ETL, I know roughly the chunks. I know, I know I'm know i loading in an hour batch or a day batch or a week or whatever it happens to be. Whereas if I'm doing serving something to the users, I'm having to guess and saying, what kind of... What kind of search predicates are people going to put in their where statement? How are people going to open Power BI Tableau and filter and slice that data? How, what kind of queries are people going to write? And that's really hard to know up front. You know, so kind of the, the art is in getting it down, getting it out there, trying to look at how people work with it, and then going, you know what? I might have to just lift that whole table up and repartition it a different way and put it down just because people aren't hitting those partition keys. And it's tricky, but it's all how are you loading data? And then at some point you switch over to how people are going to query it. Awesome stuff, dude. Okay, so then I'll take the next question in this case. Um, it looks like there was uh, some context concerning uh, when you look at Delta Lake and you know how we have time travel for history. Well, the question was related to history and time travel is that do you still recommend implementing a slowly changing dimension type two design? And so, uh, for those of you, uh, just to provide a little quick context, and Simon, definitely chime in if you, uh, if you feel that I'm missing anything. Um, like we, we so did it commonly in any of the, any OLAP design, not necessarily just about analysis services cubes. I mean, OLAP queries in general, right? The context was that you had a dimension table and you had your fact table, right? Don't worry, I'm not going to go into factless fact tables or anything like that. Just, just pure dimension and pure fact tables. <clears throat> And things change over, over time. So for sake of argument, uh, demographics information like your address. Like I used to live in, uh, um, in St. John's, Newfoundland. And then over time, I moved to Montreal. And then over time, I moved to Seattle, right? So the context is that that's a slowly changed dimension. Like, you know, and so we typically assign a circuit key, right? Uh, to go ahead and do that uh, because... <clears throat> the circuit key would be, uh, even if the primary key is me, Denny Lee, I, whatever ID or name that's associated with it, right? Different facts at different time ranges would be associated with different, uh, um, uh, different dimension values based on the address that was at, right? So in other words, what, where I was 25 years ago, any facts associated with that, there you go. Like it's associated with St. John's. Anything that was done 20 years ago was Montreal and then the rest in the Seattle area, right? The reason I bring that up is that then people are saying, well, yeah, well, I don't need to do that now with uh, data lakes anymore, do I, right? And in fact, it's definitely one of those, yes, you definitely can do it. And yes, you should do it. But also it's an it depends question too, right? So in other words, it's not it's not like you can't just go ahead and put everything in the facts. You, you absolutely can. So in other words, for sake of argument, I go ahead and put all the demographic information into the facts and... It's all there and that's fine, except, okay, don't worry, except exactly the same problem as we had with data warehousing traditionally or OLAP cubes and traditionally, your, your the dimensions don't change that often, right? I, I, at least I ho certainly hope not. I hope you're not moving <laughs> that often, right? That, re that would resort in massively large dimension tables. There are definitely those situations by the way and then that's where the debate will come in. But 
for slowly changing, not fast changing, slowly changing dimensions, that information changes so slowly that you're going to use a lot less space by simply placing it into a dimension table and having that circuit key as opposed to placing everything into facts. So then the return statement is that, yeah, that's even true for data lakes, especially if you have a really wide demographics table. Like if you include all the f content or facets about a particular person as part of your machine learning algorithms, right? That you actually want to understand the various segmentation or demographics that they belong to. So it's still slow, it's still not fast changing, right? It's still slow than changing, right? Even if you include in all the other fa uh, facets, right? Uh, like, oh, you have kids, right? You're not having kids fast enough to warrant that as a fast changing dimension, right? So because you're doing stuff like, uh, it's because it's still a slow changing dimension, that table, that dimension table is still gonna grow significantly slower than your fact. And then if you were to put all that information into the fact table, quote unquote, it would just massively grow for no good reason, right? At all, right? So yes, you absolutely would want to go ahead and do slowly change the dimension design. Um, and then there's about the technique. So I'm not gonna get too deep into that. And the reason I'm not is because I'm just simply going to send you all a link. I'm gonna paste it into LinkedIn in a second and also into Zoom uh, and to YouTube. The reason why is because, in fact, Douglas Moore and myself, Douglas Moore also comes from a, a very relational database background. That's exactly the topic. And we actually spent an hour just on that topic about SCD type two. By the way, there's also a topic just on surrogate key generation as well. Just because exactly to that point, those techniques are still just as valid today as they were in the past. So, um, so, like I said, if you are to ask me that question about fast changing dimensions, we would then Simon and I would go on for about five hours to explain where where we would deviate and why, uh, right? But the reality is because there, there's if, when it comes to fast changing dimensions, it does warrant the idea of us going ahead and actually putting them into facts. But then that goes into factless fact tables and fun stuff like that, right? But when it comes to slowly changing dimensions, at least there is you absolutely are warranted for doing such a thing. So hopefully that answers that question. I'm gonna go ahead and paste the link now just because I happen to have it handy. Uh, it's because it's on a, the same Tech Talk series that we're currently doing right now. So it becomes really handy. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully that answers that question concerning should I do SCD type two in data lakes? And the answer unequivocally is yes, you should. <laughs> type two or four, your choice. <laughs> true, true. Point taken. Point taken. I just didn't really want to go the type four route. That's all. I just, I was yeah, trying just... to avoid, I was trying to avoid talking about that. Okay. If you don't mind. All right. You, you fair, right? That's fair. That's a fair statement. Yes. That is fair. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right. Cool. All right. <laughs> cool. Why don't you tackle the next question while I go ahead and send it over the link? Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a minor, minor little, little rant. There's one of the questions, very specific. It's like a okay. super niche question. Okay. Oh, do it. So we're going. Save as table function. Does that use a separate catalog to the other hype catalogs? So it's like real, real drilling down uh, thing. Basically, if you've got a data frame, you're writing something in Spark and you go, I've kind of got what I need, dot save as table. And you want that to register in Hive so you can then go and just do select start from table at a later date, right? Super, super useful. That for me is the most misleading evil function known to man. <laughs> Because, yeah, it's great. Now, no, it doesn't use a separate Hive catalog. It does register it with your Hive catalog. So it's a standard registering. But what that does is that makes a separate copy of your data in DBFS, right? So it's going to take wherever you're... So if you're saying, I want to take something from my lake, my nice, curated, secure, managed lake, and I want to make a copy of it in the local data, um, data brick storage, which is then not accessible to anywhere else in the data ecosystem. Um, for me, that's generally a bad thing. Because like whenever we're doing things, we we nearly always use external references in Hive, you know. So if you're doing, it's kind of get your data frame, write it down to the lake, and you know, in Delta format with partitioning with whatever structures that you actually want to have to keep it as a managed, curated, good um, data set. And then there's a separate thing afterwards. Go create a replace table using Delta location, and then you point it to the lake, and that means it's an unmanaged Spark table, right? So it's basically, there's just a little bit of metadata in Hive that points it at where that data lives in the lake. And then if you go drop table and you delete that Hive reference, your data's fine, your data's safe, your data's still in the lake. Whereas if you're using that save as table, 
And it kind of intrinsically ties together your data, making another copy of your data with that Hive reference. And if you go drop table, it drops your data. Uh, and if you wanted to use like, especially in um, Azure, if you wanted to use like Data Factory or Power BI or various other things to get hold of that data, you can't see it outside of the Databricks ecosystem. So your cluster has to be spun up to be able to query it and all sorts of madness. So save as table, when you first see it, it's like, ah, that is super useful. Yeah, I just want to save as a table. But we nearly always recommend not using it just because you're intrinsically too tightly coupling the Hive registration with your actual data. And it nearly always leads to problems down the line. So we never use it. I don't know if you agree with that, uh, Danny. <laughs> no, actually, I completely understand the context because in, in all seriousness, this is a much more complicated answer than most people realize, exactly to your point, right? Because when it comes to using your catalogs, you actually need to understand your overall ecosystem. It's not just about the data lake. Don't get me wrong. Data lake is super, super important, obviously, right? It is uh, at the risk of sounding like Teradata, which is horrible. Yes, I said that. Um, it's your central source of truth, right? But the thing is that even having a central source of truth, the value is what you get out of it. Right. And so some folks are going to be able to go ahead and have more homogenous design. So I'm not, I'm actually trying to answer very, very non, very vendor agnostic. So I'm just going to say homogenous versus heterogeneous. Okay. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Um, um, and because if you've got a homogenous system, you could theoretically get away with just simply saying, okay, I'm going to use one meta store that's tied super closely to my system and be done for the day. If you're in a heterogeneous system, that is almost consistently never going to happen, okay? And then just to add a, a new wrinkle to it, if you're multi-cloud, multi-environment, like in the words on-prem and cloud and multi-cloud, which a lot of enterprises are actually either doing or starting to do right now, that in itself is its own set of problems, right? And so exactly to uh, Simon's point, then how you decide what you do with your catalog and how you connect to it, whether it's save as table, even though it just starts with a save as table statement, right? There, there, that's the implication. The implication is wh what, how you're going to interact with catalog. That's actually why there are vendors that build their own catalog services, right? Some of them are tightly integrated to their environments. Some of them are completely meant to be uh, vendor agnostic. Some of them you have to maintain yourself, which blows, but it's actually important in some cases. So, that's why the, even though it's a small little statement to say save as table, it actually implies so many different things that, um, yeah, literally I, it's obvious that you and I can probably go off for hours just on this statement too. So, so to try to cut it short so we can actually answer other questions. Yeah. It, the reality is exactly to Simon's point. It really depends on your environment before you decide something as simple as save as table or not. Cool. Uh, you want to dive into the next question or you want me to dive into it? Uh, I, you can pick a question. Why not? Perfect. I'm going to pick one run from LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn Live. Uh, there's a question here uh, from Thomas uh, uh, or Thomas. I hopefully I said your name correctly. Uh, can you use Delta Lake open source in AWS without Databricks runtime? So that's an easy answer. That's why I decided to pick that one. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Go to delta.io, go to github.com slash um, delta-io. Um, you can absolutely download the code base yourself. You can run it on AWS without any problem. We have actually, there are many uh, customers or many in the community, I should put it that way, many enterprises that actually do that. There are some issues when it comes to exactly which version of Spark you're using. So that's the key thing. So you have to make sure the version of, for example, if you're either doing it yourself or through AMR or whatever else, right? Whatever flavor you're doing, that you're actually going ahead and making sure you're using, for example, like Spark 2.4.1, at least that minimum level, or, and especially if you're using like Delta Lake 0.7.0 or onwards, then in fact, you need to be using Spark 3.0, right? Because Spark 3.0 was the one we tied, Delta Lake 0 0.7 is tied specifically Spark 3.0. So you have to make sure you get the versioning numbers right. Uh, but outside of that, yeah, no, you absolutely 100% can go ahead and use it in open source. And, and it is an open source project. Uh, you can go to GitHub, take a look at the, the code base, give us PRs, uh, give us issues, because that's actually what we want to have. So yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right, next questions. Um, 
Simon, you want to tackle this next one uh, that's coming up the wire? Yeah. What are we doing? Well, is that a LinkedIn one or is it? E We've got oh, one sorry. on Zoom, actually. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Sorry. I meant to say the one on Zoom. Sorry. You want to start with that one? I can, and I can finish. <laughs> so it. many different places. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, I know. Yeah. Sorry, okay. So if I use Data Lake or Spark with Tableau, do I need a caching layer for interactive analysis, analysis to get enough performance? And I'm, you know what I'm going to say? What's enough? If I say enough performance, <laughs> how much is enough performance? And is a, it's a delicate balance. It's the consultant's answer of it depends. Um, generally, you can do it a lot. You can, you can get a hell of a lot of performance over large data sets querying the Spark engine directly. Um, can you do millisecond style, I want to click on things and have things immediately act? No, it's a parallel system. There's always an overhead of parallelism. So it's always about what is enough. Is it are people aware? Actually, I'm querying a few billion rows here. If I put a slicer in and it takes three, four, five seconds to come back, you know what? That's that's cool because I was never able to get at this data before, but now I can, and that's amazing. Great. If people are looking at it and going, "What's it doing? What? No, that's too slow." Then yeah, you need a caching layer. So it it depends on the the style of data, the style of interactivity, and the expectations of the users in terms of what that turnaround speed needs to be. Um, in terms of what I would recommend for an intermediate caching layer, it's ecosystem dependent. You know, so I tend to be in Azure. People tend to use Power BI for that, and you've got all sorts of different modeling techniques you can use. Most of the caching layers tend to have something these days, which is all this kind of, there's a new modern approach, which is actually exactly the same as the old HOLAP approach, which is essentially saying, I'm going to keep some stuff in memory and some stuff on your Spark cluster. And if you can get that balance, that's what I would look for in a caching tool, right? Something where I can go, if someone tries to run a query and they're this great, you know, they try and summarize things by product, that's cool. That'll get it from the cache. And if they, in that same dashboard, can drill down and say, actually, give me the transaction level, then that can, is intelligent enough to go, and that one I'm going to throw to Spark because that's where the big data engine is. That's it. As long as the caching engine can do that. So all of your Tableau's, your Dremio's, your Power BI's, your kind of various different um, analytics, semantic layers, they all have things like that baked in. So as, as long as that makes sense and you're building models in a smart way, so you're saying, I'm only gonna put, essentially, cached data is expensive. To, to put something in an in-memory cache is, tends to cost money. You know, you're know, you paying a premium for that stuff that has that interactive uh, fast reaction. So if you can split out and say, you know, 80% of our queries are at this level, we'll put that in cache. And then everything else, the occasional user who asks the hard question and what's the million row answer, then they have to wait a few seconds because it goes back to the Spark engine. Then that's the kind of design you're looking for. So whatever tool can do that in your ecosystem makes sense. Perfect. I definitely would love to answer uh, answer it in, in a two-parter, by the way. So the first part is uh, uh, is a small plug. You know, have to plug it a little bit. Uh, there's the Photon engine from Databricks that actually, uh, which we announced during uh, Ignite, actually, um, uh, the Ignite, Microsoft Ignite conference, where it, it significantly improves the performance of your speed on your data lakes, okay? So it's designed specifically for that. It doesn't preclude what Simon's saying though. I wanna be very clear about that. It, it basically just means the part that what Simon's saying about, I want to be able to look at my billions of rows and I want that to come back not in five hours, Okay, yes, that's what the Photon engine is designed extremely well for, for that purpose. All right, versus there are gonna be absolutely some scenarios, especially where you, like you, just like you said, 80% of your queries where frankly, you don't need to have all the data. You wanna be, you, you, you need to make it, you need to make the, the queries uh, more efficient, right? Uh, for that purpose, for those can reporting, for the ad hoc reporting, for the you, that line of business, things of that nature, absolutely. Then it makes a ton of sense for you to go ahead and build uh, whatever caching layer. And again, it, that's very ecosystem uh, dependent. The one thing I, I would, would like to call out is actually, it, it's actually very reminiscent and uh, uh, sorry, Simon, for me pulling up this old one again, um, of the Yahoo 24 terabyte cube, right? where basically we built this cube where we could get the queries down to six seconds. This is about 10 years ago now. So uh, in which the source of the data was actually um, multi petabytes um, in, a, in, th in thousands of nodes Hadoop cluster. And then we end up processing the largest cube on the planet, 24 terabytes. Why do we do that? For pr precisely the same reasons actually that we're talking right now, right? There was this idea that for 
a segment of the queries, yeah, we were just going to use the analysis services cube to go ahead and deliver that result because it could deliver it in seconds as opposed to hours or never delivering the answer at all, right? Versus, okay, now I really need to go to the details. Yeah, this will take hours, but at least you can get it done as opposed to never getting it done, right? Which was then using Hadoop, right? That's why we would do that. Now, obviously our technology has changed over time, but the reason I'm bringing up the scenario is, is not to recommend using analysis services and, uh, um, and Hadoop. No, that's definitely not the reason I'm saying this. The, the reason I'm saying this is because the context is that even though the technology has changed, our reasoning hasn't, right? There are scenarios in which you're going to need super fast and it, it's a subset of the data and it, it makes sense for it to be a subset. You don't want it to be all of the data, right? And there's a scenarios where you absolutely need to go ahead and look at all of the data, right? And those, those two rarely intersect because it rarely makes sense to say, give me in, in like less than a second, all of the data, right? Just because, okay, it's great. You got an answer, except it's not very useful. <laughs> to you, right? So th that's more or less the point, right? So it, relative of how the technologies have changed and how we sped things up and all that stuff, there are definitely going to be times where a caching layer is appropriate. And there are definitely times where the caching layer, especially if it's fast changing data, it's not going to be appropriate. And that's okay. So just understand how to categorize which data is which. So that way you can go ahead and organize uh, accordingly. And a lot of the time it's Comes back to that um, we we're saying last time the the whole real time like do you need to be real time? It's a lot of it's the same kind of because you've got that cost on the cache and as you're saying sometimes the cache just isn't that useful and it's like a do you need to cache all of it? Do you, well, you need you need to get that much in really? And it's yeah it's 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 ROI right? Yeah, exactly. It's no, kind no, of no. like we're the cost the of page. building the yeah. thing and engineering it yeah. versus the cost yeah. of actually running it. Yeah. It, it, it is, is exactly the point. Like often people, when they think about that, is like, well, do you have unlimited money and unlimited resources? Sure, maybe it's possible then. But the things that last time I checked, you don't have unlimited money and unlimited resources, number one. <laughs> and number two, again, it, it allows you to, by not thinking about it, allows you, to, you're being, uh, being a little harsher, but it's almost like lazy, being lazy, right? You actually do need to think about what subset of data is actually meant for that super fast query because it's directly line of business versus what yeah. side of queries that are designed specifically for the idea that you are trying to develop your new lines of business, right? And so it's not like one's more important than the other. They're both equally important, but they are designed to do two very different things. And there, there has to be that separation uh, when you do that. Cool. Absolutely. I think we probably nailed this one. So I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next. Okay, next. Um, do you want to... I know you're an Azure guy more than an AWS guy, so I can probably possibly go with this question that, that I just saw on YouTube Live. Uh, what are the top five biggest differentiators between Azure Databricks versus Databricks on AWS? And I can definitely start if you'd like, uh, and then you can color code it. Sure, okay. So uh, honestly, there isn't much difference between the two. So uh, to, to, it's actually very, very, very ecosystem driven, right? So like, what's a big difference? How you set up your VPC slash VNets security. IAM roles versus service principles, a la AAD. Um, the Databricks ecosystem, whether it's on AWS or on Azure are pretty much the same thing for all intents and purposes. There isn't really that much of a difference here. So what it really is about is more or less which, which cloud environment, which cloud ecosystem you really want to use. And for those environments, yeah, like there are going to be things like, okay, well now I have to care about IAM security roles. Well, that's obviously AWS specific or AAD security principles or how you set up your VNet or express routes or whatever else, right? But you'll notice that my answers are very infrastructure related, not environment related, right? You can use for sake argument SageMaker in AWS, or you can use Azure ML on uh, Azure. Okay, well, but those are your differences, right? The differences are more the 
which cloud environment are you more comfortable with? And in reality, it's getting more and closer and closer where it's just not which one you're, uh, which one you're comfortable with. You're going to have to be comfortable with more than one. <laughs> so it's more about like, okay, well then how do you simplify using the various components on those cloud environments more than anything else? So at least that's, that's my answer real quick. I mean, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Simon. I mean, honestly, I don't have too much clarity, right? Just because I very rarely work in the AWS ecosystem. There's one or two things that occasionally from an infrastructure point of view, you'll see pop up in one and then balance out to the other a few months later. Right. I think the only example I've got of that is um, spot VMs, right? I think right. you can do that currently in AWS. It's coming in Azure, what, later this year, then as to Ignite. You know, so that kind of ability to say, I've got a job. Honestly, I don't mind if it just disappears halfway through and it comes back because it's not priority, but it's nice and cheap. That kind right. of thing, but that's an infrastructure related, right? That's because yes. that kind of functionality was available in AWS, it got implemented, and it's coming in Azure, so it'll get implemented. And it's like how it can take advantage of that underlying layer, but the engine itself. Yeah, exactly. We're, there, there's really no differences between, those two, uh, between the, the cloud environments, right? It's pretty much... We, we release based on what echo, what infrastructure environments the cloud environment is able to provide. And that's pretty much it. So. I think cool. there's some like deeper techie stuff with uh, like ADLS Gen 2, it works slightly differently than it works with S3 buckets, which is slightly different than Blob, just in terms of because Absolutely. of the Absolutely. Yeah, yeah if we, if we, exactly. If we want to go do that, for example, we, we can talk about how the fact that uh, ADLS Gen 2 actually does have, um, has different write consistency patterns versus S3. But the thing is that we really are diving deep now, right? That's going so, <laughs> See, yeah. But that that actually, that yeah. that kicked my ass a few, uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, true, um, okay. What happened? Because I was using Autoloader. Okay. So Autoloader, all sorts of cool, Essentially, in, a, in, in the Azure side, it uses a thing called Event Grid. Right. So it's basically a, a, an event watcher. You know, so you have your blob file, you land a new file in there, it goes, ah, got a new file, and it kicks off a load and it starts running some stuff. Um, so essentially, using Event Grid, kicks off the thing, puts it in the queue. Databricks is looking at that queue and goes, what's happened since I last ran? Or it's streaming, and so it just picks all the stuff up as it goes. Um, because I think we were using ADLS Gen 2 for it, um, rather than landing the file, it landed the file as a temp file and then did a rewrite. And so, because it can rename the thing. And so it has landed the first file that kicked off the event grid job that it had a blob create. And then the rename changed it to the right file format. So the file didn't get picked up because of the way that we're writing it down. Whereas doing the same thing in blob and it was happy because it doesn't do the rename. <laughs> just there just trying to unpick them. It can see the file. It, what is that not? And it was all because we were writing it down and it was renaming it after we saw it. But by the time we looked at the file, it had already been renamed. Man, that took me a long time to figure out what was going on. It's like, but it's fine. And it but it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So exactly. When you, what, what's interesting, and there's a question that came up on LinkedIn, but I'm not sure how to, how to answer it because I'm not, it's a little too vague, but, um, but it actually goes exactly with what you're talking about, Simon. When you're, dealing with situations that are much closer to real time or near, at least near real time, right? Streaming style where, and the volume is so high, right? Exactly to your point, then all of a sudden things like how the underlying disk works starts impacting you. Uh, this gets us into, for example, the small file problem, right? The, the massive amount of, if you have lots of little smile, uh, little smiles, little files, <laughs> Right. What ends up happening? Right. Um, that that basically uh, it it allows you to optimize the rights, for, uh, especially for your streaming application. But it certainly doesn't allow you to optimize your reads. So then you actually have to do file compaction of some type in order to be able to read those. Right. So so um, that's why when you run streaming applications, you're typically floating this stuff into memory. So that way you're actually you don't actually have to hit the IOPS, um, the disk IO. Excuse me. Uh, or storage IO that comes into play every time you're trying to read the stuff right off the disk, right? It, it just bleh, right? So fun stuff like that. Um, the the those all come into play massively, and so in the end, 
at the the deeper you go into running streaming applications, and even though even though it's just auto loader, it's actually starting to go down that route, right? Mm-hmm. The more likely you're going to have to be cognizant or aware of the underlying storage system that you're playing with. So, but it's I think there was a question about uh, there's two questions actually to hook into that. So oh, cool. there's one about uh, optimizing in vacuum and how often you run it. We can come onto that in a sec. And that was the last of one of the benches. Uh, but there's one about leaving uh, a cluster on when you're streaming. Is that kind of a requirement? I think I was in there somewhere. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's that's the interesting pattern I've been doing recently is the trigger one streaming process. Oh, yes. So, a fan of that one. Please. Triggers, yeah. It's doing the, essentially, most of the most people write batch queries, right? Most people right. need to process data hourly, daily, whatever it is. And we're kind of get you go down a rabbit hole of trying to work out how do you programmatically say, just get the files I need. Just just get, I have a process up to there, maybe you watermark it, maybe you got some kind of CDC, maybe something's dropping files and you're collecting it, whatever it happens to be. Um, but we've been using Autoloader recently, not in the streaming thing, but with trigger once. Mm-hmm. So there's a little option you can just put in saying, only trigger this, just run, run a streaming job and uses full structured Spark streaming sets up, runs through, does a micro batch and then goes unfinished. And so, you know, we're using that at the moment to say, get anything that's come in since the last run. And so previously we had like all the frameworks saying, this is how you work out the files that came in. This is the file pattern to match for files for this hour, pass a parameter in, look for this file and all that kind of stuff. Now it's just run it and it'll get anything it hasn't got yet. And so you can run it hourly, you can run it daily, you can run it once a month and it will still just go, I'll just get anything that came in since I last did, but you're still dealing with all those streaming problems. So we're basically doing, we've essentially taken a batch process and added streaming problems just to, you know, make life interesting. Um, but if you're worried about having a, using streaming but not having the, um, the cluster turned on all the time, you can do that kind of pattern just to go, I still want to stream. I still want to have things coming in and landing in an event hub, turn on every hour and just get everything I've got. And then get that pattern working. And then if you then switch it and go, actually, we're now getting enough value to leave it turned on all the time, there's, that's no code change. That's the, just change the parameter you're putting into the trigger. And the same thing will just run as a full-time streaming job. Like exactly. Is. Yeah. And I, I did want to add, like, for example, from Summit, I want to say like two years ago now, Comcast actually went on stage to talk about their environment. And it's exactly this trigger once that you're talking about, right? They basically, because they had converted their batch jobs into streaming jobs, what they literally did was go from, I want to say, if I recall the numbers correctly, 84 batch jobs that they had to maintain down to just three streaming jobs in essence. And then because they were able to get down to that, it was easier to maintain. But even better still, they went from something like 640 VMs down to 64. So they saved a massive amount of resources and time because they, so even though ultimately they had an always on scenario, they actually were saving massive amount of money in the process for doing that. Right. So there, 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 there's actually, it's actually really powerful. And then uh, actually this is a very uh, apropos. We'll, We'll probably answer this one other question before we go into data and AI stuff, but how do you manage backfills in that case? Right. It just came through on, um, on YouTube. And that's actually extremely appropriate, right? And so this is, by the way, why uh, you'll often hear us talk about the medallion architecture, you know, bronze, silver, gold. The idea is that because you built your pipelines to, in which, because you're doing trigger once and you're using that Q, uh, you, event grid or whatever it is that you want to do for, you know, for your, for your, for your, in essence, your queue mechanism, you don't actually have to move the files. Okay, so traditional systems more like, okay, I take the files, I copy them over to indicate that I need to go reprocess. Instead, your backfills is more like, okay, if the streaming job shuts down, okay, turn it back up, it has a checkpoint, it goes back and grabs from the last time you actually need the files. But then the reason I brought up the medallion architecture is like, how about if there's actually errors in the silver and gold, like as you're trying to filter augment, as you're trying to aggregate or build your features, because you've got all the original data, it's all sitting in the original location, change the checkpoint, change the start point. Instead of having it from the most recent file, go back to the beginning, reprocess, rebuild your silver, rebuild your gold using streaming. Obviously you're gonna need to knock up the number of uh, nodes in order to catch up faster, right? But that's a temporary process. 
knock it up, process. Once you're did, roll, roll it back down and you're back up and running mm -hmm. again, right? And that process now is more complicated to do in batch than for the streaming because from the standpoint of streaming, all you're doing is like, oh, okay, just you aim from a new starting point. That's all you're doing, right? So it's, so it's an important call out. We've made yeah. it more complicated because yeah. you, can, you, can, you can go to the next stage, right? Sure, sure, sure. So again, in, 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 I don't like the term medallion architecture, but yeah, in a, in a enough, three stage lake architecture, yes. sure. You know, you're landing into your first layer, raw or right. bronze. Yeah. And that's just yeah. an append stream, right? That's just a that's dump right. all my that's data. All I don't care if it's a duplicate. I don't care if I've seen it before. I don't care if it's an update. You're just, just trunking this data. Bum, 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 bum. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a stream. Uh, and we're streaming delta streaming. So raw is a delta table. So we insert appending into there. We're doing stream from a delta table into a middle tier, silver base, whatever you want to call it, delta table. And did a video on it yesterday. Uh, you can do merging on a stream. You know, so you can say micro patch for each batch, do a delta merge. So actually you can just drop a new file. And even if you've loaded that file previously, it'll work out the merging and it'll just kind of slot those files in. Now, not the most performant for doing a high volume live, live stream, right? But for doing the trigger once, if you're just saying, just use this mechanism and actually just turn on and just churn through anything that's come in, it's quite a neat way of just getting the changes and just kind of just merging it into silver and not caring about not having to reset checkpoints, not having to do the low level management, just going backfill, just chuck a new file on it. Just reload the file into blob and it'll just go. Exactly. So uh, last time I checked, that wasn't that complicated then. What are, what are you talking about, dude? No, it's fun. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, I'm like, all right. Make a function. <laughs> exactly. I'm just saying, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. Um, all right. Uh, we only got a few minutes left. So let's end with doing a quick call out on our respective sessions. So you want to you wanna start or you want me to start on this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can go. Please. Um, so on, go for it. On, on that, I'm doing a. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the I've name of your session for data and AI. So let's start with that and then we'll go from there. <laughs> I think it's something along the lines of designing lake house models for SQL in Databricks, something along those lines. Sure, so sure, sure. Okay. Essentially, or, fair enough. <laughs> I, I can come out with the proper title. I don't know it off the top of my head. Is that bad? Should I know it? <laughs> uh, it's okay. It, by the way, this is this tells you everybody who's still watching us uh, that haven't been basically disgusted with our banter here that yes, you, these questions are be quite live because sometimes. Even though we've talked about this, I still managed to surprise my 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 <laughs> co-host on this question. Achieving lake house models for Spark 3.0. Bam. <laughs> Which is essentially some of this stuff, how you model things for the end user. So not the engineering, not the getting data in, but actually what are the things that you can do because of Spark 3, because of uh, adaptive query execution, dynamic partition processing, because of some of the Delta functions, how do you actually get the SQL people a good plane to actually work on? Perfect. There you go. Okay. Prepared. Bam. <laughs> that, that, that was beautiful. Definitely take a look at his session. It's awesome, especially for our European friends, because it is designed for that time, but it will be available on demand if you don't want to wake up three in the morning. Admittedly enough, that's my, not my favorite thing to do. But there you go, okay. And then in, in my case, uh, I'll freely admit that I forgot the name of our title too, okay. Uh, this is myself <laughs> and Barack Yavis. <laughs> we, we, have, we either called it under, under unpacking the transaction log V2 or under the sediments V2. <laughs> I forgot which one we chose. But it is a technical dive into how the transaction log of Delta Lake works. This is not, um, obviously we're showing demos on Databricks, but this is not Databricks specific. This is uh, very much into how the open source Delta Lake um, works. Uh, we dive into what the V2 checkpoint works. It's, uh, it's a follow-up to our unpacking the transaction log uh, tech talk that we did originally, but it's, it, it follows up with the V2 design. So it's, it's not just V2 of the video or the tech talk. It's actually V2 of the actual checkpoint design itself as well. So it's actually a fun play on words. So, <laughs> so there's that session. Uh, we also have three fun 
uh, AMA sessions, uh, as Karen had called out in the beginning. I'll be emceeing two of them. One will be uh, for the um, for VIPs, specifically on lake houses. Okay, uh, the both the if you want to think about it from the concept or the paradigm of it. The other part absolutely is uh, if you want to dive deeper into technical, the other one that I'm emceeing um, is absolutely on the photon engine itself and the Delta Lake itself and understanding the technical details. So it's myself with uh, four other engineers. So come prepared with your geeky questions because that's the stuff that we're more comfortable answering anyways. And just, and for all those who are data scientists, we did not forget about you. We actually have an ML flow session specifically for you to talk about uh, where you get to ask questions from the ML flow engineers and with uh, my compatriot, Jules Damji, he'll be seeing that. So lots of fun. And then of course, as Karen called out right in the beginning, we will have a fun AMA session with Malcolm Gladwell. Um, if you have not already read his book, Outliers, do it. Another good book for if you are a geek and you don't like talking to people, talking to strangers, that's a great book as well. Um, and the reason I'm promoting him is because he's a fellow Canuck. That's right. Go Canadians. Um, but nevertheless, also, if you are don't want to read, but rather listen, he's got an amazing podcast series called The Revisionist History. It's an excellent podcast series. I highly, highly recommend that. It's probably a lot more organized than myself and Simon. I would hazard to guess. Yes. What do you think, Simon? I think that's a fair statement. How dare he? Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. Yes. So, okay, I think that does it for our little call outs. Um, Karen, why don't you? Finish the show for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Denny. Thanks for adding on uh, some added details on Summit. Denny and, and is way more involved in Summit uh, with sessions and whatnot. So I'm glad he's able to share a little bit more about what we have going on for you all. We also have three meetups uh, too. They're on the Data Plus AI online meetup group page. So if you're interested in joining us uh, there as well. I also see I have a, I just checked my email. I have a few uh, folks that emailed me for VIP passes, which I'm excited about. Uh, so I do have a few left. So uh, email me or message me in LinkedIn uh, and, and I'll send you one your way. We'd love to have you there. Uh, with that, thank you so much for your time, Simon uh, and Denny. We'll let you get back to your session planning for Summit. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. <laughs> Take care. Have a good day.